Today's scripture story is one of the lectionary texts for this Sunday. We discussed it in our Worship Seeds discussion after church last Sunday, not knowing fully the world uh, had uh, broken open. Um, And I decided to keep this as our scripture reading for today. Um, It's another one of Jesus' healing stories uh, in a particular kind of healing which always are about bringing people back into community, about healing divisions, about reconciling um, uh, folks back to the community. And so it felt like it still spoke to us for today. Jesus and the disciples arrived in the country of the Gerasenes, which is opposite Galilee. As Jesus stepped out on land, they were in a boat, a man of the city who had demons met him. For a long time he had worn no clothes and he did not live in a house but in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he fell down before him and shouted at the top of his voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. For Jesus had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For many times it had seized him. He was kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles, but he would break the bonds to be driven by the demon into the wilds. Jesus then asked him, What is your name? He said, Legion for many demons had entered him. They begged him not to order them to go back into the abyss. Now there on the hillside was a large herd of pigs feeding, and the demons begged Jesus to let them enter these. So he gave them permission, and the demons came out of the man and entered the swine, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. When the swineherd saw what had happened, they ran off and told it in the city and in the country. Then people came out to see what had happened. And when they came to Jesus, they found the man from whom the demons had gone, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. Those who had seen it told them how the one who had been possessed by demons had been healed. Then all the people of the surrounding country of the Gerasenes asked Jesus to leave them, for they were seized with great fear. He got into the boat and returned. The man from whom the demons had gone begged that he might be with him. But Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. So he went away, proclaiming throughout the city how much Jesus had done for him. May these words be to us, our light and our life. Thanks be to God. Well, friends, this week our country finds itself again wrestling with its demons. All week we've been struggling to understand just what possessed a man to open fire in a gay bar in Orlando, killing 49 people and injuring 53 more. Was it mental illness? Was it homophobia? Was it radicalized faith? Was it easy access to assault weapons? We try to answer why, hoping for something that will help us make sense of the immeasurable grief, hoping for a way forward so that we know what to say to our children when they ask us why we haven't solved these problems yet. And unfortunately, it all feels like a well-worn path. San Bernardino, Charleston, Newtown, and in between a relentless pattern of gun violence in our streets. Are these terrible tragedies carried out by deranged individuals 
Or are they also symptoms of an entire society addicted to violence, obsessed with guns, and possessed by a malevolence held, uh, by a malevolence hell-bent on self-destruction? How can we drive this penchant for violence out of us? But no matter how you look at it, at the center of this heinous act is hate. It was hate that killed our people at the pulse as they danced. It is another example of scapegoating, the same mechanism that killed Jesus, the same mechanism that seeks out in anxious times scapegoats for fear and powerlessness and kills them to temporarily appease our false gods. And we should remember, or at least I choose to believe, that at the root of all hate is self-hate. But we are here because we believe there are other responses to anxiety and fear. There are other choices besides hate. We find strength when we gather here. We find courage from sharing in stories of faith. We find hope and a path to action in God's vision of peace and justice, whether it is demanding gun control or celebrating the virtues of our Islamic brothers and sisters or, man, or marching with pride for the rights of gays, lesbians, bisexuals, transgender, and questioning folks. I am so grateful after a week such as this to be able to return here to be with all of you to celebrate the power and the call of love and to boldly claim that God's radically inclusive love is still possible, still possible, even in this world, as broken as it is today. I am grateful to be part of a community that doesn't just preach comfort, but also calls me out into ever-widening circles of community and connection. Amidst all the reactivity to the events of the week and the fear that threatens to isolate us, it seemed most appropriate today to create a space for reflection and connecting. So I'm going to stop talking and give you a chance to share. I have two questions. And like we do with Prayers of the People, I'm going to open it up for you to share from your own experience of this week. The first question is just simply, how has this tragedy impacted you this week? What have you felt? What have you noticed in your own experience of the news, of the initial news, or what's come out since then? Let's just start by sharing a little of what we've experienced this week. One of the things that struck me, I mean, of all the myriad of emotions that go when, when you learn of something like this, one of them was um, the sadness that I feel for those who um, were trying to maybe get the courage to come out because it takes so much courage um, to come out to family and friends and that this probably put a lot of people back in the closet. I was so moved by the doctor of the ER team uh, that treated all those people and his compassion no matter who he was caring for and uh, talking about his shoes and how those were going to be his memory of the love that came out of that tragedy. Last night, Janet and Don and Rachel and I went to the Interfaith Iftar at the mosque over here um, on Minnehaha, and um, I just was struck as the um, all the speeches. So before the breaking of the fast, there were speeches and explaining about their faith and things, and um, all of the leaders of the community talking out against the violence and just the pain they felt at being held responsible for the actions of, of a few in a way that I didn't have to speak out 
when someone from the Lutheran church shot up somewhere else, you know what I mean? So um, also just the welcome that we had, I've never felt so welcomed in my life. Every single community member like stopped and thanked us from coming with like just such love and like I got several hugs. I mean it was, it was amazing but also, um, also really hard that they had to, that they had to speak out for the actions of someone else. I was disturbed because there is a tendency among the conservative or reactionary or dogmatic interpretations of scripture that declare homosexuality and its different manifestations as contrary to God's will. So we're obliged to not only put it down, but uh, but eliminate it insofar as we can. So I think uh, I was always frightened at the prospect of having to deal again with the interpretation of scriptures that calls for um, dehumanizing and uh, this was reinforced as I understand it a couple of days ago when one of the victims of the violence was having a memorial service and uh, there was a, a crowd waiting outside of people who felt that maybe they should lay some guilt on th those who supported uh, the homosexual lifestyle. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's always embarrassing when we share the faith with those who sometimes uh, greatly exaggerate. I am still livid with the NRA, the gun lobby. I don't know how to get past it. We heard the news as we were traveling down to southern Illinois for my father-in-law's memorial. Uh, he died last year, came out of a family of mixed uh, Native American and poor uh, white miners, so-called white. And they're all gun-toting. I don't know if they're members of the NRA. They vote Democratic. They're from all over the place. And it was a joy to be with them and not have to have conflict over this, but to share in the sadness. And the other thing I wanted to share is the fact that this isn't just a affliction that affects America. It's affection that an infection, really, of males, you know, men who are upset and angry that they are no longer in the dominant position wherever they go, and we need to address that mm. and accept that. Uh, the, the heartening thing was the immense compassion that so many showed for so many, including victims for each other. The hopeful thing was when the, I believe it was a senator from Connecticut, finally said, I am not going to join in your moment of silence. I am leaving this chamber. I am so sick and tired of all we can give to these people is silence. Forget it. And maybe some people, maybe, maybe, maybe it's the beginning of a turning point. Janet gives a good segue to my second question, which you can respond to the first, or the second question is, what are signs of hope that you've seen this week? It's on. I'm responding to the first question. They were so young. Most of them were still in their 20s, and they had their futures. Who knows what they could have accomplished that's been just wiped out for no good reason. It was so sad to pe see the people come out of that building not knowing whether they'd be dead or alive by the time they got out. Hi, uh, a sign of hope. Efforts are gaining momentum to take back our democracy, to fight back against the corporate lobbyists, including the gun industry. I've posted two articles downstairs, including information about uh, some tabling we're going to do in July to get people to support Move to Amend. Uh, two nights ago I was listening to NPR and two reporters were talking about it and 
One of them was saying, well, they're not finding much evidence that this is a terror-based uh, mass shooting. It's more a traditional kind of mass shooting. And I was just stunned by her use of the word a traditional mass shooting. And it really drives home how much we let this happen to the point where <laughs> I don't need to finish the sentence, do I? I mean, My first reaction to it, I'm embarrassed to say, was, oh, no, not again. <laughs> and then I thought, that's, uh, that's poison. You have, to, you have to maintain outrage. We're the only country in the world that has a problem of this magnitude. And <laughs> to the point where it's now been declared a public health threat. <laughs> which I find outrageous. I don't think there's any other country that would be able to declare that. Um, one of the, there was a Southern Baptist Convention in the news, and I think this was part of that story that they said, God doesn't make mistakes, that the gay lifestyle is a mistake, and it's a human mistake. But I'm proud to be part of a church that believes that God doesn't make mistakes and that it's not a lifestyle. God made us this way. That's a sign of hope to be part of this community. One sign of hope that I see is that uh, the Senate filibuster resulted in some kind of action being taken on the Senate floor for gun control and that it will be a major issue during the 2016 presidential campaign and so it won't go away quickly and our chances of action are better. The other uh, sense of hope that I have is just the opportunity for all of us to um, be kind to one another. It's a reminder of how important that is in our daily lives and it makes me want to um, remember to make one act of kindness each day. Last night Adam and I told our kids, we've never told them about the shootings before. If you don't know me, I'm a crier. <laughs> and I'm furious today that I had to. And there was a hope in that our kids' response was like, how could anyone else hate someone who's LGBT? They were furious. And how could someone be angry at someone because they're Muslim? And it was their family and their friends that we were talking about. So there's a little bit of hope. I don't want to tell my kids ever again about something like this. I had the opportunity to attend a concert of the Twin City Game Men's Chorus. One of the things that came out of that program that we might not think about, the violence to that community does not always come from strangers. <laughs> but from their own families. One thing that's starting to come out, I think, is the notion that someone around this particular shooter knew something, his wife, and we're starting to get a sense of her responsibility to do something. And I'm a, a bit hopeful that maybe this time we'll learn more about our corporate responsibility to act. I was with the youth this last week on the mission trip. <laughs> And we made a conscious decision to not talk about the shootings while we were there. Because we were dealing with so many other things in Garfield Park and around Chicago. But the hope that I see out of the youth that I was with is very powerful. The support that they showed to each other amidst everything that they were going through and the love that they have for each other and the compassion that they showed for the people that they were meeting and interacting with regardless of who they were or where they were coming from gives me a lot of hope for what comes next. We gather as community, as people of faith, broken open by events such as these, by tragedy, by our own longing, by experiences of loss and grief. When there are things too big for us to hold, it is good that we can gather to be held by a larger community, to be held by God's presence, but also to be reminded to look for hope. And so as we gather up these experiences, uh, our own longings, 
We're going to conclude this time with a moment of remembrance for those who were killed and injured by this gunman. What does 102 people look like? This is 102 candles. Actually, there's 12 more in the balcony, but it's 102 people hit by bullets. This is what it looks like. And so, in memory of them, as we pray for them, their families, the communities they come out of, for ourselves as a country, I just invite you to come forward or in the balcony, uh, find the table there, and light a candle, and offer your own prayer. Let us pray. This is the prayer of Reverend Nancy Taylor at Old South Church in Boston. God of music and light, of strobe and disco ball, God of the pipe organ and the 303 bass machine, God of Latin chant and Latin rhythm, God who smiles over nightclub dance floors, we remember how you were hated for the wide stretch of your love. We remember how the hate of the small-minded cost you your life. God, since you know how it feels to be hated simply for being your own fabulous self, Please draw close to the people of Orlando. Please be sheltering, shimmering wings upon every blessed person touched by this tragedy. Be a mighty fortress built of pride and courage. Bless every person who goes out dancing tonight in defiance of hatred. May every hip Every eyelash, every sequin burn like a star in defiance of hate. We pray these things in Jesus' name.